Greetings, healthcare colleagues. My name is Kevin Kocek. I'm the founder and CEO of Chemical Q Device, here for discussion 88, June 22nd, 2023. And today we're going to talk about how to program in quantum machine learning for healthcare. So this is an important topic, and it's definitely working its way through literature and in other means too. So basically, you use quantum machine learning where it makes sense to. So in, in specific pieces of code. Um, and we'll have more people filing in here too. So, you know, it's it's definitely a thing you have to watch a bunch of lectures. You have to definitely uh, read a bunch of papers, you know, for your specific application. I posted in the chat prior to this, it's a, it's a paper. It's a Los Alamos National Laboratory paper. I highly recommend this to anybody. It's on archive. So I think they've updated that one. So it's 2023. I'll put that in the chat. But basically this one, it, it breaks it down. There's kernel methods for quantum machine learning and there's uh, basic convolutional or quantvolutional neural nets. And depending on which avenue you choose and which type of data, your advantage will be based on, on those decisions, meaning the resources that we have today and your choice of what you're trying to do basically. So I'm gonna put this in the chat and feel free to chat um, as well, you can come on. So there's the, it's, they go by LANL or Los Alamos National Laboratory. I would just keep reading it. I reviewed it, I think back in October last year, and it makes a lot more sense now um, based on other kind of things that I'm working on. So that's that one in specific. So are there any questions? Uh, you know, I guess, what are you looking to get out of the discussion today is, is my main uh, kind of survey. And feel free to, you can unmute, uh, you can come on, or you can po post in the chat as well. Yeah, Hi, go Kevin. Ahead. Go ahead, Rahul. Hi, first of all, uh, nice to meet you. I've been looking forward to these meetings for a long time now, unfortunately. Uh, couldn't uh, to, uh, you know make it through, but um, um, so I'm looking forward to to attend this first one. Uh, I've been you know I'm a regular uh, reader of all of your meeting uh, briefings about quantum and application to um, healthcare. So um, I my takeaway that I want to do is uh, I'm interested in quantum computing. I have. Uh, um, done some quantum computing challenge from IBM, but uh, because of the nature of the work I do, it's uh, quantum is not heavily used. Um, it's all traditional, you know, classical machine learning. And um, so just wanted to get uh, um, some understanding, see, if, you know, if I can, um, if I can pursue on my own and, um, you know, look, look, looking forward to it. So that's that's the main interest to understand, you know, to 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 know more about the topic, um, in general. Yeah, I would strive to to get a real good fundamental understanding of what's going on, because obviously you have, so quantum you can't do anything with quantum alone, or you can't do much, and most of the times you'll either see it classical to quantum and back back to classical. And then as we start to get more and more quantum data, meaning data obtained from quantum sensors, then you can get better benefits. And that's the kind of like the what the um, Los Alamos National Laboratory paper goes through. So, you know, to simplify it even further is you have classical data. Uh, it needs to be put in a way that it turns, it's basically converted to quantum data. Some things happen, quantum mechanical with gates, um, and then at the end of it, it's called measurement. And at measurement, mm -hmm. you're, you get bits, uh, so yes. zeros and ones. So mm -hmm. depending on how you choose to embed the data or encode the data, and it, depending on what you want to do with the, this variational quantum circuit, will um, de determine the, the bits that go back for classical processing. Okay, so if, if I understand, um, you're still using the classical domain of ML, but then yes. also seeking help of the quantum ML. Yeah, so if you go through all these tutorials, there's most of them are still valid. So like an Andrew, Andrew Eng, uh, spelled NG for his last name. I've been going through a bunch of those tutorials because you're still dealing with issues such as overfitting. Like if you have too complex of a 
a classical quantum system, you're going to mm -hmm. run into those types of things. So you really, you have to understand machine learning to be good at uh, quantum machine learning is, is my conclusion at this, at this stage. So, so no, I, I have been working in traditional machine learning myself for the last few years. It's just that I want to come into quantum ML picture now. Yeah, yeah. And I would say, and everybody else in the chat room is definitely strive to understand, okay, quantum mechanical principles, you know, like um, there's times where you want entanglement for more information. There's times when you want a larger feature space. Uh, so that would be like a kernel method I mentioned before. And, you know, that's, you're trying to think of things that don't work well in classical and trying to use, you know, small quantum circuits. It's going to be a while for like, you know, quantum computing is linear. So linear algebra. So you're not going to necessarily have 100% quantum neural networks and quantum will likely insert its place where it makes sense to, but it won't be as, I don't believe as universal and broad as what we see with classical, but at that same time, it can have a, a large or very large impact um, in the in the places uh, substituting for classical where it can. So, yeah, it's all it, you really have to read a lot of papers and you know go through a lot of lectures uh, to kind of pinpoint w how you want to use quantum for your specific application. Uh, did that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, I know I understand that. Um, it's just that I was more curious about, you know, this, uh, like the application to health and, you know, health. Yeah, and, I, and we'll talk about data a little bit. So this, the LANL paper that I put in the chat, um, and I can do that again for some, uh, some other people filing in here. So, yeah, so uh, Ron, I've talked about this before. So there, there's the LANL paper. However, they have updated it. Uh, more recently in 2023. So that's worth to, to check out again. So on the data side, if you have classical data, it needs to be perfectly, they, they use the word hope. So you hope to have your classical data to be embedded in a way so that you're getting this quantum benefit of an exponentially large feature space with, with interference, okay? Now, if you're in the quantum data, uh, you don't need to do that. So you're already, you're already in this space called Hilbert space that's exponentially large. You get interference and that's what's preferred. So if you look at like images, they're not quantum data, they're classical data. So that's the hard part is getting the classical data to mesh up correctly to get this, uh, you know, this Hilbert space that's uh, beneficial to use. And this could start going into priors um, and in specifically inductive biases that you would have in classical, do you have an, a quantum inductive bias that's worth utilizing for your specific case? Yeah, so yeah, so the the nature, so Ron's talked about this paper as well. Um, and there's, uh, sorry, is it, okay. Um, there's, yes, there's a lot else going on in quantum. But so you have to figure out, like, if you have a lot of data that probably won't work with real hardware, it's just still too noisy for most of it. Like if, if you have like thousands of images, it's just your chances of things going, uh, not the uh, direction. So Rahul mentioned, so Andrew, so I would definitely, you you're, you have to really understand classical machine learning too, because when I run experiments, like I have to know dropout, not as much dropout, but um, weight decay, and steps, uh, and then so say if I want to change my step after a certain number of epochs, you know, all of these things are all valid uh, or fair game in, in quantum machine learning because the bulk of it is remaining classical code. And like I said, you can have a very good chance of, you know, inserting quantum where it makes sense to potentially with simulators. If it's anything speed related, it would have to be real quantum hardware. So. Um, anybody else, any questions or comments? So this is definitely, so it's how to program in quantum machine learning for healthcare. So if you have anything more healthcare, that's that's perfectly okay too. Uh, so some people that joined, so we have uh, Kaval or Victor, um, do you have anything? Go ahead, Kaval. Hi, Kevin. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, Kevin. Uh, so, yeah, 
basically uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, you, can, you know like uh, compliance issue with respect to data so when we are looking for uh, quantum with ai like qml what are the scopes do we think of with uh, gdpr what was the last part with gdpr so it's a data protection law in europe is it uh you do you know the abbreviation for it uh yes so i mean everything with you know quantum machine learning with simulators simulators just run on gpus and cpus or, or tpus um so that would be the thing is regulatory agencies okay with that running on you know standard hardware it, but it's set up yeah. like as a quantum simulator and then were you able to find the abbreviation so yeah it's a general data protection regulation okay and you know as far as data goes i, I think we're still far out from having from utilizing quantum data you know from you know day to day for medical uses and a lot of this and even in machine learning and deep learning is it's going to be and it is a, a focal point for research and development right so that's before clinical and some of these other things um but yeah I, as far as things run it's basically quantum mechanics inside of a, a classical environment um the I don't know. When I get for that for abbreviation, I get more of like a data sense, you know, good data. Um, but it, I, I don't know how far it's got because, say, the thing that's leading right now in quantum is cybersecurity. They just passed two of these ISO IEC, uh, or they approved them, right? So yeah. th this means all federal agencies, this is a law back in December 20. 22 out here, all federal agencies must implement cybersecurity defense uh, using simulators on, you know, classical hardware to prevent against attack, right? So that's, that's kind of like leading things as far as working its way through all these, um, these industries. So, I mean, I, I can't, you know, as far as everything else with data, I think a lot of it is going to strive to continue to use classical data in these hybrid environments, such as if you have images that go classical image through a kernel, and then it, you know, goes into a feature space, you know, for quantum, those types of things. But um, I, I, I don't really have too much else on that one. Yeah, I think I think I I got a point here and the insights. It could be the possible if you are going for product development with QML uh, in healthcare. Uh, yeah, I, I think, think the biggest it's a hybrid computer. Yeah, options is also, better to start with. Right, hybrid computing. So you're going to have CP. Well, yes, hybrid computing, classical quantum, but it's being simulated inside the classical environment. You also have the the quantum internet or quantum hybrid internet that's coming up too. Mm -hmm. And there's, let me put it a different way. There's billions of dollars between IBM. There's other healthcare organizations in the U.S., such as NYU Langone, Mount Sinai um, Hospital, yeah. that have chosen to to start working with the technology. So that that's a big thing, right? There's already a, a quantum computer installed in Cleveland Clinic out here uh, from IBM. And I, it sounds like it's going to be a matter of time, but I, I would say the ones that get through the, the quickest, it would be the methods that you can already run on classical hardware. It's just in a different way, like a, a quantum simulator. Yeah, that's right. I agree with you, Kevin. Yeah. Cool. Um, anybody you. else? Yeah, that was the question. Awesome. Uh, Ron, did you have something? Is my microphone working now? Yes. Okay. Um, I kind of messed it up in the chat. I was trying to drop a, a new a link to a new article, um, but I was it got intertwined with my, my comment on your uh, Los Alamos uh, article, which I was excited to see because previously you posted links to Los Alamos articles, but they're in Nature magazine or they're behind the paywall. So, that, so I'm, I'm excited to see that one. Um, but the link that I post was a new announcement for a 256-bit neutral atom machine, which uh, is apparently available now uh, via Amazon Briquette. Um, I haven't read the paper yet, but that's very exciting. That's very wide, 
Um, I've had a lot of excitement about neutral atoms. They should have a much better noise profile. They should have much better uh, qubit to qubit connectivity, even over trapped ions. Um, so can't wait to see what's in there. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up. I mean, it's just everything that's going on between hardware. Um, a lot of this will be on Kiskit and Pennyling, which is software. And I included some other ones too we can talk about. But yeah, it's it's very encouraging to see. And hopefully this will be like the summer of, you know, quantum <laughs> breakthroughs and it help maybe even helping some other parts of society out, you know. I get Absolutely. a pretty... Uh, so I did a little review on this too. So if you don't want to read that whole LANL paper, I kind of pulled out some main points. And again, I got a lot more out of it when I read it for the second or third time this week. Um, it's it, it, If you're trying to to make things work in uh, QML, I would that's one of the first papers I would start off with. So they go into barren plateaus and um, local minimums. So there's just things that are inherently happens with certain types of quantum machine learning algorithms that don't happen as much or at all with other things like uh, uh, quantum convolutional neural nets. So, and it helps to, if you read that, um, you know, the full article, it'll tell you like, okay, this could happen, you know, with barren plateaus, or this could happen with excess local minimums that you might not even know of, and you can spend several months of, of research time uh, going down these these rabbit holes that you you probably don't want to. So I, I'm i a big fan of Seth Lloyd at MIT. So I watched uh, a couple of his videos this week too. And even you can go further back. This is a 2014 uh, Google one. And it's just interesting how, how the, the industry has, has evolved and especially how their, you know, his knowledge and other professors' knowledge of QML has increased throughout the years too. Uh, anybody we haven't heard from, Edwin, uh, Victor, feel free to come on so you can ask a question, you can comment. And, it, you know, I, I think some of you have been on before and definitely looking to get on. Start running, start running on IBM Kiskit, grab some Penny Lane demos. I've done a bunch of those and just don't stop, right? Because that'll be the limiting factor is, you know, if it's just, doesn't make sense, but um, a lot of times you could do stuff for free or very cheap, especially on Kiskit. And, you know, the the stuff that's, there's many of things in quantum too. I would say if, if you haven't researched it, you can usually find the answers that you're looking for, but you have to dig, right? So start off in a, it's called QHack. So Q and then H-A-C-K. They have like 40 speakers this year. I think they had about 20 last year. And that'll help frame your mind as far as, okay, this is, you know, this is the way I should be thinking towards this. Um, one gentleman said it isn't just exponentially large feature space. It's that plus uh, interference that you have with quantum. You hear a lot of people say that. Uh, did you have something, Cabal? And then if not, uh, Francisco or Sabine. And another good thing from this LANL paper is basically they have uh, like four references for quantum embeddings, which I deal with a, a fair amount. Um, you know, uh, basically initialization. So it's uh, like, I get slow initialization with, because the quantum simulator has to talk between you know other aspects and collab, uh, and then you know collabs GPU, which is an NVIDIA V100 or A100. But a lot of times it might be if it's a five minute epoch on average, it might take twenty minutes or over to run on the first run. And sometimes if you're looking to get the best overall time, you can run a first epoch, cancel it, and then run it again. And then your first epoch epoch is about what the other who are like 29 other ones are if you're doing like 30. So there's stuff like that. It's just, it's very specific. Um, and you just have to keep reading to figure stuff out. Um, anybody that we haven't heard from yet, any other kind of, kind of questions or comments? 
And I mean, for my world, a lot of this gets uh, definitely intertwined with the classical. So most of my mo other meetups are so I can get a good feel of AI. Um, there's Google ca Kaggle competition. Somebody in my city won like $700,000. But a lot of this is going to be hybrid, right? So hybrid coding with simulators, you know, as, you know, as say if ion trap or neutral atom takes off even more, you know, you're sort of having that quantum component. But if you don't understand classical with, with a lot of these things, and kind of my forecast with this is those that are really good in deep learning, classical machine learning, their computer vision, uh, once they fully understand quantum or, or research it like we are, watch out, right? Because that's the bulk of it is um, it's, a, it's a lot of running you know, understanding the parameters, to, their hyperparameters to change and in, in, in all these types of things. So uh, that's that's going to be the big boost that I see because there's a lot of experts out there, such as Andrew Eng, who I had mentioned a little bit er earlier, and Kevin Murphy and, and otherwise. And a lot of them haven't been won over by quantum yet. And if you go to chats, you know, <laughs> it's just, it's not the, it's not as like mainstream as, as classical for sure, but uh, more power to you. Get a head start. <laughs> so, Ron, and yeah, if you want to come on, um, Eagle One Twenty Seven is available on. I, I saw that. I logged on, and so for those that don't know, so IBM Kiskit or you know IBM Quantum, they're kind of leading in the hardware side of things. One hundred twenty-seven qubits, and yeah. Yeah. I, so if you have a IBM uh, experience account, you just an IBM ID um, for their free platform, you can go over to their uh, uh, their cloud platform. You have to set up a separate account, but you can use the same ID, which is kind of cool. Um, but it gives you access. So it gives you access to a, a new range of machines. The free tier is. Um, basically about the same as what's available on, on the uh, IBM experience uh, platform. Uh, but I think there are a couple more machines. However, they are offering credits. Uh, if you can find codes, um, for example, uh, I saw one go by that said that it was worth $500 for if you spend it in six months, uh, but you have to upgrade from the free tier to the uh, standard tier or something like that. And uh, supposedly if you do upgrade to the standard tier, uh, you, you're supposed to have ac access to the Eagle. One, or I think they only have one Eagle online. Maybe they've got more now, but that's a 127 qubit machine. Um, I've had, when I did the uh, IBM Quantum Challenge, I got to the end of it, was able to submit one whole job to the Eagle took a while to come back and it was a bit of a mess. But um, the thing with the Eagle is be when you have 127 qubits, you got to keep your eye on the circuit depth. Got to, uh -huh. you got to, you got to spread the, you got to, you got to spread the width of the algorithm out and not the length. So that's what they, they computed is called circuit depth. And if you get over a certain, a certain circuit depth, you start banging in the coherence and noise issues. But um if you can get five hundred dollars worth of credits, and you have to go out there and hunt them down and and uh, find the find those codes, uh, you can probably get a lot of, a good amount of time uh, on the eagle uh, if you if you really want to experiment at that size. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up. I think they had a, a recent paper out too. Uh, I didn't get around to reading it, but it's you know it's yeah. a lot. That's the paper that I, where I got the information from, but definitely go over there and create a cloud. Uh, create the free one for sure. Uh, if you create the free one, you get two hundred dollars. Uh, you get two hundred dollars worth of credits, um, but you may not. But you don't automatically, as far as I can tell, get access to the eagle. Um, but if you find these other codes that, like, is might be in that article that you were saying, Kevin. There might be a code in there that you can use that will get you a five hundred dollar credit, but it's it's kind of it's kind of a scam because it's going to force you to, <laughs> to use that credit. You got to upgrade from the free to the standard tier. Yeah. The other the only other thing about that thing which they don't tell you about until you're out halfway through the sign up is you have to give them a credit card. Oh um, yeah. So yeah, they so. don't 
They don't charge your credit card. They they swear up and down they're not going to charge your credit card. You stay on the free tier. Uh -huh. They just want they just want it for ID. Uh, so this time I usually don't do that, but this time I, I gave in since I'm so invested in IBM stuff right now. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Um, Edwin asks, so free tier is yes. I, I imagine it's still seven to five. I run off of Nairobi, which is seven for a while. Number one to keep all my experiments the same. Number two, I think that's kind of like the highest. That I don't know if they bumped that up at all. Uh, if they bumped it up to say a twenty some, I, I remember the gentleman on last week, uh, Zoran. He, I think he was running on a twenty five or twenty seven, and that was like whoa, you know, like you know, number one, they had the resources to do that, and that was back in I think mid two thousand twenty two, and it was. It, it's just that paper from last week is very good because it 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 has a lot of diversity in it, like with uh, explainable AI and um, they use both simulators and, and real hardware, but yeah, it's the IEEE Zoron and it's uh, EHR data with rheumatoid arthritis. He did it with Dr. Frederick. Uh, he, of, he used to be, of, um, I think he's moved on to a startup from IBM. Zoron is, uh, works at Amgen. So yeah, that was a cool paper because it, it was just, is ahead of its time, right? Their results are reflective of it because of the hardware, but what they were doing was ahead of its time. And even 2023 papers I've seen a, a lot more straightforward than kind of what that um, IBM Amgen paper is. But yeah, I mean, for everybody, definitely get on the smaller qubits. Number one, you have to start understanding how these things work and say like, if you're doing a certain thing, can you predict what the outcome will be, you know, uh, even the prediction before you even run. So that's highly recommended. And Edwin and others too run those circuits. So I put in the chat last week, you know, it's basically um, entanglement circuits. You, it's literally a click and it sends the whole circuit to IBM Composer. And then you click again to run. Like it's like two more clicks and you're running. So hopefully those that wanted to run have been able to run. Uh, that's really the, the main determinant, you know, get on, run experiments, keep running, you know, and definitely for the bigger programs, I, I focus on they're more simulators because it's most of it's classical code. And then part of it's running through this uh, PQC or parameterized quantum circuit, uh, slowing things down and then further investigating the effect of it all. So I was able to get 44 classes up from 10 and I haven't seen any more than four. So it's, uh, you know, you always check your work and install confusion matrices, these types of things to, to verify. So, but it, it could take you places for sure. I wouldn't say that you, you're most likely not going to get a lot better results, but you want to get it running with quantum, right? Just proof of concept, get it running. And then if it's on simulators, it's going to be slower. If it's on real hardware, it's going to be noisier. So uh, I saw some other people pop in. So Anand or Victor or Balahi, go ahead. Got a couple uh, speakers on. So <laughs> Ron and Balahi, either or. <laughs> kind of what you want to get out of machine learning. Uh, is there anything from healthcare too? Healthcare problems you want to see solved. You know, uh, based on your in information, you know, how could quantum help or how, how do you think quantum could help too? Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, I had you mention about that IQ hack and uh, it, reminded, it reminded me about unitary hack too. <clears throat> and they were, they had, a, they had a, a hackathon that only ended like uh, a week or two ago. And uh, I think it runs in end of May to the to the two first two weeks of June, and they were giving some awesome prizes there for yeah sol solving different kinds of uh, quantum problems. And I think for uh, also uh, anyone interested can go check right now because they're giving they're giving uh, donations. Uh, uh, what do you call them? Grants for research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it was, it was interesting. Uh, it came to mind after you mentioned the, the, that IQ hack. 
Yeah, I think both of those. So QHack and Unitary Fund, they both obviously, you know, QHack is run by Xanadu. So Xanadu has photonics as far as their quantum computer. They have Penny Lane for their open source QML software. Unitary Fund, I'm a little less uh, aware of, but I know they do grants and, you know, other kind of things. It's run by a gentleman, his name is William Zhang. So I you don't hear too much, you know, in 2023, but... In recent years, he published a lot uh, with quantum computing, and I, I think for more finance driven. So William Zhang is definitely a leader, and other people on that board or you know running a unitary fund are definitely uh, more known in quantum. I would say. So yes, it's good you know to give back, and it's it's good for startups too to kind of put stuff out there, and um, you know educationally or. You know, they're doing uh, grants with Unitary Fund. I think they're smaller grants like 4K, but it can open up some doors. Anybody else we haven't heard from? Yeah, this is Balaji. Uh, just an idea. So I used to wonder about the MRI machine. It is also a quantum machine, basically. Um, so it uses the hydrogen in the water molecule and... Uh, the position, the analyze, and get the MRI uh, scan. <clears throat> so it's a kind of quantum level uh, it works. So to get the accurate picture of our brain and other parts. So in that context, I was thinking, uh, the, uh, we had a um, meetup on, uh, from IBM about quantum music. So the quantum music basically, I mean, um, they use the quantum circuits to create uh, different uh, music. Uh, we had a session in our meetup, Zen for Quantum. So I was thinking whether we can use uh, quantum uh, music uh, for uh, quantum, I mean, like uh, curing certain uh, diseases. Each organ vibrates in a different frequencies. If you take brain and heart, it has its own rhythm, beats. And uh, if you combine that in quantum level, like MRI machines uh, works on a different uh, fluctuation of the hydrogen molecule. Um, so if you can create a, 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 a organ-based uh, music kind of vibrating uh, molecule, uh, it is possible to uh, simulate what is normal cells vibration to your music and uh, cure that way. Yeah, I mean, these things are always, they sound interesting for sure. I, in my experience, you always have a ton of technical stuff. So, I mean, it may work out as you want, but a lot of times you either have to change things along the way to get a solution, say. So, you know, if I understand it correct, is basically so you have water and f and fats too. So fats have hydrogen, and then you would, you know, say, do this in a way where noise is going through quantum circuits, and then it's it's uh, when it runs into a, a certain organ that has disease, then it would exhibit an output or something else. And it, you know, I would say keep going with that. I mean that's the main thing right the the idea is the easy part but the development and actually like you know does this work and then testing it over and over again those types of things is is maybe the hard part but um i mean it's good it's good to keep, think up of things many many people just lost imagination in, in their lives and um you know it's good to have these kind of like creative ideas so I, I think the biggest thing would be hooking up with medical people and that that type of thing as far as like, you know, it sounds like the the meshing between the the quantum circuits and the sound waves and organs and those types of things. So yeah, it's good. It, it sounds creative. And like I said, it's usually the hard part is in the the R and D with with all of these things. Right. Yeah. Uh anybody else we haven't heard from? So it sounds like at least one person here is coming from a machine learning background. And I would say, keep talking to other machine learning experts because the quantum part, I, you don't have to know 100% about quantum in order to insert a quantum circuit. You just have to know enough. And I would say, especially if you're in a team of people that 
you know, you, you don't have to like, you know, read 10 books in quantum to insert a parameterized quantum circuit where it says insert here. And then by the way, if you change to a couple different gate types, I mean, you're not going to get know everything about modifying it, but it's definitely something that'll get you going. So in simulator land, it's slow and hardware land, it's noisy. So that's, that's the main gist of it. So I think a lot of people are choosing the, the noise-free approach because, you know, it's the better of the two, but you're going to have to spend more time, basically. So from that perspective, does anybody have questions, I guess, coming from machine learning, you know, going into, you know, medical, uh, QML, setting up a simulator, you know, how to install a, a quantum circuit? I'll give you a hint. Just research a bunch of demos. And then it'll kind of give you the idea for like, you know, say Penny Lane or Kiskit as far as what you need as kind of like that, that bare minimum to get started. And then it's, that's basically it. I mean, there's other things that I've had to do. So say if I change a, a, a neural network that's classical, I have to know the, the, the final output layer. How many, how many, say for instance, it's a fully connected layer. Does it have 512? Does it have 2048? Those types of things. And a lot of it's just common machine learning problems that I want to do to, to improve my hybrid quantum machine learning model. So I think that's where the thing a lot of people in, in QML that don't have that machine learning background are going to have a hard time with because it's just it's just basically traditions of you have to search these things all over the web to find values that you would get errors for and you have no idea what it means. So that's kind of where I'm at. <laughs> I watch a lot of quantum. I also spend a fair amount of time with the deep learning, the experts in machine learning. And a lot of times they'll say one thing, I'll change it, and it made it better, right? The hybrid QML model got better because of something uh, that's that's known basically in machine learning. <laughs> awesome. So he posted something in there too, so you could check check that out as far as jobs, and then. Um, I'm trying to think as far as like other papers that are kind of, I've there's a ton of penny lane papers out there, especially with a classification and beddings. So they call it quantum metric learning. And that, that one in specific is that you're, you're tuning the parameterized quantum circuit on it. Or, and then there's other ones such as MIT uh, Torch Quantum, where you're, you're tuning the actual circuit to make a better algorithm. So circuit approximate equal, equal to algorithm kind of thing. So there's some cool research going on out there. It's just, I wouldn't say a lot of it's super mainstream at this point, uh, but if you have questions, you can usually get them answered too. So any any questions as far as quantum circuits? Because we, we talked a lot about hybrid, but it's to me, it seems so easy because I, I can imagine the code that's classical to quantum. I can change the embedding. I can change the uh, the unitary, and then I can change measurement, but not much now, more like in a year or two. It's called Hellstrom measurement. So it's going to open up some other things as far as uh, better classifications. But there's just there's tons of things, especially at the, the Kiskit and the Penny Lane, Penny Lane has this uh, data re-uploading problem. You use a single qubit to classify information. If it winds up turning very efficient, it could be one of the things that broke through and say is starting to replace you know, classical classifiers. So classifiers, I mean like dog, cat kind of thing. And you go up and up and up with, with classifications too. And then there's testing too. Right, so you have to look at, so IBM Kiskit has this uh, demo up there and it's basically you're testing uh, with, it's called, let's see, local and global effective dimensions. And you you can get things such as, so these are quantum kind of terms as far as um, not specificity, but they're, they're quantum specific terms that you need to keep it, you know, as, you know, trainability, general generalizability, these types of things that applies to other aspects of neural nets too. And if you gain an understanding as far as like sigmoid functions and what's going on coming off of a quantum circuit and how that applies to importing it into a hybrid model, 
then you start to get an idea. Okay, if I put this quantum aspect in it, it's going to change this. It's going to make it better. It's not going to make it better. Uh, and you, your guesses will uh, improve in accuracy as far as your final results if you're getting you know, losses and accuracies, uh, like a tip, typical ML model kind of thing. Uh, so Amen or Victor, uh, do you have anything as far as uh, quantum circuits or hybrid programming? And then if not, uh, those that talked before, so Ron or uh, Cabal, feel, feel free to come back on. And then uh, we also have Edwin, you can come back on, or Rahul, you can come back on as well. And they say, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Ron. I was just going to mention that um, in a previous uh, attendant uh, to your, your last couple of weeks, uh, a PhD out of Turkey, um, her name was uh, Imine Apkinar, Dr. Apkinar. Uh, I got a copy of her paper on uh, quantum support vector machine usage to uh, go after pediatric MRI scans. And I'm about two thirds of the way through the paper and I hit the math. So I have to slow down quite a bit and uh, get, uh, you know, try to un unravel a lot of the mathematical stuff. But um, it's a pretty, pretty interesting concept. Uh, for those of you who know what the support vector machine is, um, from your machine learning stuff, uh, it's usually considered like an entry level or like one of the most simple machine learning models to train. But it's but it's got some tricks. Like one of the things where you can enhance a support vector machine with is by um, setting the setting the SVM up with what's called a uh, a kernel function in, instead of just tr uh, training the weights uh, based on a standard. X um, polynomial, you can you can pass a function to the training thing, and that function, um, if you craft it cleverly, you can speed up the support vector machine uh, training cycles and uh, improve the um, uh, what do they call it? You know the uh, the the distance between this the uh, hyperplane and, and the and the classification sets. Uh, so what so what their approach is is they're using quantum computing to discover that uh, discover or or fabricate coefficients for that uh, that uh, kernel function that they pass to the SVM and that's and by just by doing that they're getting the uh, machine learning thing to improve by a couple of a couple of percents. Uh, sadly, this study has got a whole 49 data samples. They have, um, these are, uh, these are, this is supervised learning. So these are labeled uh, data samples. And of the 49, uh, what they're, they're trying, they're trying to classify the, uh, these samples into one of two classifications. And this has to do with uh, two, two particular types of tumors looking very similar on MRIs, or, um, but having incredibly different treatment uh, protocols. So it's real important that you get, you get the right one. Uh, unfortunately, not only is the set small, it's not balanced. For, uh, 40 of them are one type of tumor, tumor and they only got nine for the other type of tumor. So they have to go through some of the some standard machine learning tricks like uh, data augmentation. Uh, they use a specific kind, um, although it, it almost feels like I think they're just using replicated data. But they're, uh, I think, in the medical world, I think uh, people are a little bit afraid of data augmentation as a uh, mechanism for uh, expanding a, data, a labeled data set. Uh, but I'm finding the paper very fascinating, and it's, it seems like it's clear that they've, they've used quantum to, um, to improve a process in, the me in medical imaging, so it's pretty neat.
Yeah, it's it's the kind of field like you keep researching it and it's like, wow, now I can do this and I can do that. Um, like I said, with uh, Seth from MIT, it's just like, you know, he'll just break things down and he'll repeat things, the things that are really big, like exponentially large feature space, you know, over and over again. And then I'll hear from a Q hack that it's also interference. But that's at the crux of it. I mean, you can only get so lucky just guessing gates. Um, and I can run gates through, you know, certain tests to find certain, you know, sign functions and these types of things. But if you have a better understanding of how quantum works before all of that, and exactly like, okay, this will benefit here because I, I understand what's going on with the qubit at this point, it'll save you a lot of time. So it's everything. It's quantum physics, it's quantum computing, it's classical computing. Um, you know, if you, if you want to try to make something that's probably going to be unique, you know. And I, I think a lot of us have, have struggled with, you know, small data sets. And I've, um, you know, some of my images might have 200. And they could use Kaggle too, Google Kaggle, because they have a ton of brain tumor ones. I imagine they have other types of tumors. I'm not sure pediatric, but that's always worth checking out because you can develop off of it and say that bump up to like a Lani, uh, which is laboratory neuroimages, or um, there, there's Oasis, there's a, a bunch of different ones, but they typically are stricter with re restrictions, you know, like how to use those types of things too. Um, that was actually the thing. So I was watching this presentation, they said beyond, you know, if it's, you know, you're trying to make a better quantum machine learning model, that's number two. Number one is the data. So you want more data. There's MIT has this thing called MIMIC, M-I-M-I-C, I think. And it's a it's basically a source for data, but it can be tricky to get, right? Because a lot of times they'll ask how many degrees do you have and that kind of stuff. But um it's you know that's the number one thing it is the data. Uh anybody else we haven't heard from? And that's cool you you brought up uh data augmentation. I, I, if you remember the one on um uh, it was quantum GANs, so generative adversarial networks. And then in specific, it's like GANs aren't you know really fully accepted yet, but it's basically creating new data through a, a discriminating network uh, in, a, in a feedback loop. You start off with a bunch of noise, like 90% noise, and you have 10% real images, and you wind up with uh, a bunch of images that look like real images. So that'll be the the, the crossing point <laughs> if the FDA starts to, and other agencies too, start to employ uh, these, then it, that definitely would get, get data sets up, but they're not technically real. They were trained off of other real images. So... It's an interesting field for sure. And, uh, you know, quantum federated learning is another one. But for most of these things, and Ron had mentioned QSVM, there's other Q versions of other things uh, in, you know, machine learning. You, you just put a Q in front of it, basically. Uh, trying to get to the point where they're faster and uh, better performance. And then feel free to put in the chat. So you can put in the chat as well. And, um, you know, the... It's, it's difficult and it's challenging. I would say it's harder than I thought, especially on the machine learning side, having to learn all of this. And uh, I feel like I'm gaining traction though. Uh, go ahead, Balahi. Yeah, I was thinking about the synthetic data. Sometimes you're not having enough data. Uh, there is a way to generate the synthetic data that is uh, based on the available data, distort that in uh, different angles, and you get uh, synthetic data. Sometimes we can train using that. Yeah, it just depends on the field, I think. I so for something like finance or, or medical, maybe maybe not as much. But yeah, I think and the, what Ron was kind and there's this whole field called generative AI, by the way. So I think it's just it it's to you can't use it if it if it scares people, right? So this isn't a real image, but it was trained off of other real images. Is that good enough, like a GAN or GANs or, or quantum GANs? So that's, yeah, data augmentation. And I know a lot of times you can flip it, images. So you can take it one image and just horizontal flip, and then they'll call that a second image. But it's, they're technically different, right? So it's just, it's the level of all of that. And is it, for the specific case, is it 
is it appropriate to to data to flip a thing horizontally and you know rotate or all that kind of stuff? Awesome. Um, anybody else? So obviously, you know, quantum machine learning. You have medical, and then what are the next steps with it all? And I would say start definitely start with the quantum cybersecurity because it's the first time. You know, it's the first time that. Uh, you know, quantum algorithms are going to be simulated on PCs all across the U.S. to prevent from uh, international um, quantum attack, you know, so how that goes, basically, if there's any hiccups, and then it'll start going to other things. But that's the pressing thing is people could steal data now and decrypt it later kind of thing. So it, there's actually a law right now that requires federal agencies to implement quantum cyber defense. And then you'll start to see it going into other areas, I believe. Okay, so Edwin has a question. So do quantum models also need those large data sets like classical LL? Uh, because like the paper by Zeron we talked about last week, they use a small data set. Okay, so this just depends. So for things like transfer learning, you don't need as much, right? So I think I'd mentioned that before last week. So transfer data is already based on some other model, say a, a thousand classes called ImageNet, and that it's based on real and um, man-made images, right? So that's already trained. And then you're, you're taking those weights and you're learning from those weights. And then you don't need to use quite as big of a training data set as you would if you didn't use the, the ImageNet with you know ResNet, all this kind of stuff. So there's cases where you don't have to use and these already exist with classical. So you could have a classical transfer learning model and you could do that like, I think there's at least four ways of doing transfer learning where you don't have to have as much data. I've used a quantum transfer learning model it, it compared to the other ones that I've seen from Penny Lane, Qiskit, uh, TensorFlow Quantum, um, I guess uh, Torch Quantum. It, it was the one, it, it caught me because it says you can put in any, a high resolution image and it will resize it for you. So that was really encouraging to use that model because it seemed to be more thought through than other ones. So I, I don't think you're gonna see that at this stage as uh, quantum not needing as much data. I think that's more as like, um, you know, that might be a future thing. I, I don't think there's a benefit for that quite now. And, um, Oh, okay. So Cabal says, yeah, GAN MRIs using NVIDIA to my project. Yeah, for research and develop and develop and Cabal, you can come on for this definitely. For R and D purposes, I think GAN and medical is totally being used. It's if correct me if I'm wrong, it's more like a you're preparing for the future if GANs are more accepted to get data set size up. So um I appreciate that those comments, Edwin and Cabal. So I yeah yeah go ahead yes yes Kevin so basically um, I was doing my thesis here in masters and uh, we I was not able to find any MRI scan files uh, on public data set so my professor has advised me to use GAN because we can use only GAN for R and D you are correct I hundred percent agree and still that is the same practice we are using for any AI modeling. So that is for a medical data set. So they ask us to use scan and then only you can go for data modeling and find the accuracy. Yeah, and it's solely just to get the, the training images up? Sorry? It, it's primarily to get the training number of images up? Uh, so I'm, I'm getting the, so what I'm getting from you is, uh, you are asking me how I have get that files, right? No, is it is it solely just to get the number of images up so you can develop an effective model? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, I tried to get uh, like I it was like four four years earlier. At that time, I find only like it was taking me forty five to fifty minutes to generate one single file. You know, GAN is kind of uh, fighting with each other, and there is a feedback loop to accurate with the real file and that was a uh, kind of a clone of the single one file and they will uh, make it double 
after all uh, 45 minutes of modeling. So that was, uh, uh, you know, it was it was uh, kind of expensive to even create that uh, file, each file. So that is what my experience with NVIDIA. So even uh, creating the file is expensive, though it was not 100% accurate. Uh, accuracy is not more than 90%. It could be increased. It's still, you know, to create a file, it's very hard. I haven't worked on that one afterwards, but it is a good, uh, point I have experienced, like even generating the files using CAN, it's it's not going to be 100% clone, you know, accurate, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And I just <laughs> want to mention, so there's other things besides images. So there's EHR data, there's omics, so DNA, RNA, protein. I did watch a YouTube video off that. So that's basically, you know, things are moving from an EHR data with a vector into basically a, a a, a better, an easier way to represent it all. But I, and, and other things too, like you can represent DNA as an image, right? So yeah, we, yeah I mean, like the versatility of QML is not just limited to images. I agree. And is that, uh, is that the way these guys are using uh, for drug discoveries? They are using the DNA images? Um, that I don't know. I, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if somebody did just because that's like, okay, you could take a portion of it, approximate it. I've got to touch up on that field a little bit because some of it crosses over, you know, say if there's like more development being done in drug discovery. And the last I heard is like, you know, if you have a 3D molecule, you would flatten it into 2D and then you would run it on a, a D-wave quantum annealer, which is yeah. like a 5,000 qubit. And it's just for optimizing the data a little bit. So, you know, it, you know, there's probably a lot going on out there. Uh, I'll just put it that way. As far as uh, drug discovery targets, because you could do, you know, you could look at mRNA, um, a number of things, but if they, you could come across something, if you highly approximate, you know what you're doing hundred percent and say, we're looking at this specific area. And then we think that we can do this and we'll do a bunch of tests with DNA, with a, a quantum, you know, hybrid quantum with annealing and, and CPU, G, yeah. GPU. Yeah. So I, I don't want to be the one that finds out, finds about it in the news, but at the same time, some of it's not going to be made uh, public. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I, yes, sorry. So yeah. my understanding Thanks, of, of, of drug discovery is that uh they use the quantum algorithm to scan the the database of every known molecule to man both natural and every molecule that we know how to ma manufacture currently so they use a quantum algorithm to scan those and its job is to pull out the best candidates for a particular uh purpose and then once they pull, once they uh, reduce that that massive database to a set of well qualified candidates, they send they send those candidates to a classical machine learning uh, uh, stack that will then make predictions on those. So what it what it uh, what it, it saves them a huge amount of time because each time they send a molecule to these to one of these machine stacks, it it involves a tremendous amount of computational power just for one thing. So if you can make better choices up front to give that stack, yeah, you're, you're going to save time. And um, I know there's at least one company that's had some success there, where they um, they use that technique and they they were finding drugs to uh, be effective for certain diseases and that sort of thing. Uh, the DNA stuff, that's, that's another whole arena. And uh, I haven't heard too much about it, but I'm convinced that there will be quantum versions of things like uh, DNA sequence searching and that sort of thing. Yeah, it's sounding very broad. I mean, even in imaging, it's broad. It's just, you know, not as complex as DNA, to say. Um, and for specific tasks, so like Ron said, scanning all these molecules with a single algorithm. And uh, yeah, I, I would imagine it's probably a lot more than that. Like many, many cases, it's just like the, the extreme. So 
classical machine learning is still viewed as like the workhorse, right? So you're using quantum in a way that it, it, it can affect the results of, you know, every epoch it's going through this, you know, CNN say, or some other neural net. And then it goes through your, you know, at the end of it, your fully connected layer at this uh, quantum circuit. And then it's doing something else that the classical stuff isn't quite a, akin to. So I, in my opinion, you, you could still come up with, you know, based on a lot of the stuff I've seen, something that's pretty cool, you know, with a hybrid algorithm, but the, the bulk of the processing, and I guess you could say flops is, is being done in the classical ML. So yeah, that's the way it's looked, especially the near time stuff, kind of near term stuff is uh, definitely more of the, uh, you know, it's assisting somehow. So in images, it could be, it, you know, a kernel in a convolutional layer that scans over images, or it could be, say, like, um, at the end, where it's, you know, for classification, they call it a dress circuit. So you have classical, quantum, cir uh, classical, and the quantum's doing something, you know, to affect the image classification at the end. So it's cool stuff. It's, if you look at this, the, like the, uh, you know, quantum algorithms and they abide by linear algebra. So talk, listening to other experts talk on this, neural networks are not linear. You know, they're like, like the brain cells that we have in our head, they're set up, we have nodes and it can go down and then, you know, three to two to two to three. So if that's the case, then you might use a quantum algorithm in a certain way that it's not fully quantum, you know? So it's just, you know, say if it's the linear portion, the backbone that goes in the middle, these types of things. So it's limited by the, uh, you know, linear linear algebra, basically. It's uh, yeah. what it's really good at. Yeah, that's that's right. I totally agree with you. It's more about machine learning is going with uh, uh, linear dependent variables. So yeah, that's the thing. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, exploration with respect to DNA and imaging data sets going on. And, you know, it's, we don't know from where exactly we can start now. I have just started to explore uh, courses. I'm doing one of the course with the uh, Amazon Bracket in uh, in India, there is one uh, institute, it's uh, IISC. It's a well-known institute in Bangalore. And uh, that's, uh, in collaborated with uh, QPy, so they have a very good uh, uh, R&D and a marketplace they are putting. If somebody have a very good idea or R&D, you know, so a lot of the a lot of stuff is also going on. Uh, I'm just started it now, so uh, I'm I'm going to learn it with the Amazon Bracket, and they are having options of uh, QML, so they are starting with linear algebra. And, and all very basics. Yeah, so and, when I will okay. see next time, I will give you more, more, more content about the course. And I mean, what I have learned, I can get it back more about uh, basics. Okay. And one of the things we haven't really talked about is all these surrounding algorithms. So stochastic gradient descent, you have Adam, you know, and others, Adam SGD optimization, loss functions, all those types of things. And the Andrew Eng video basically said two things kind of broke apart the market or basically helped deep learning, machine learning was neural networks and back propagation. So, I mean, it could be, it could not be a neural network. It, it could be an algorithm that's assisting the training of it, you know, so every time it goes through, okay, now the quantum algorithm thinks that these weights and, and biases are the best. And then you pass through another epoch and those types of things. So I haven't heard too much from that, but then again, I haven't looked at that too closely, but you know, there's those types of things as you're looking um, to improve things with quantum that you can't quite do as well classically. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the kernel or the uh, QNN itself, those types of things in my opinion. So we'll see. Uh, any other last questions? Appreciate everybody coming on. Uh, this has been Discussion 88, June 22nd, 2023. Uh, keep researching, keep studying, and keep running experiments. Take care, everybody. Bye.